Um, it is my uh, great honor to be here and uh, uh, to give this uh, Kabbalah Symposium at the APS March meeting. And um, it was kind of tremendous uh, the burden as well, I think especially following this uh, uh, Claudia's talk. And we have a lot of the interesting topology to mine and then and you can try to serve us a supplementary information as Paul said <laughs> of this previous talk. Um, also, it is in a sense kind of uh, very interestingly situated and I think it's rightfully situated uh, between this kind of bridge that I'm going to tell you about these uh, atomic layers and the heterostructures and in a sense uh, this is kind of subset of materials that, uh, that can be produced. I'm always amazed by the uh, Claudia's talk that such a kind of engineering and such a design of the atomic unit cells to produce this bulk sample with the um, the uh, predicted or sometimes a completely unpredicted kind of new properties comes out. Uh, that's an amazing part. So in a sense that uh, the, the, the community I'm just kind of representing is basically using the subset of this three-dimensional materials and reconstruct into the, uh, the two-dimensional structures or that, uh, the quasi-three-dimensional structures and try to provide the additional functionalities. And sometimes we know that uh, the our unit cell or our the basic standard is starting from the atomic layer and stack that to the uh, the quasi three dimensional structures. And sometimes those kind of structures doesn't have even the periodicity or quasi periodicity, which will kind of naturally lead into the next talk that uh, were given by the Mark or Sharon, that uh, where you see that so those quasi periodicity or no periodicity also plays kind of important role. In fact, this 2D materials or 2D uh, atomic layer is already uh, in technologies and everybody's pockets and computers, we see that this all the modern technologies actually rely on now this, uh, the controlling the atomic levels of these uh, structures. Already the all of the gate dielectric and the CMOS, at the, you need the at almost atomic level of this, the controlling of the layer of the engineering. Of course, over the past centuries or so, uh, half of the centuries, the semiconductor technologies got evolved to produce those kind of materials. So indeed, kind of really layer by layer fashions and modern MB can produce this, uh, the heterostructures, almost atomic layer of the control and uh, in the wide ranges. And this becomes a really technological relevant system already being used in uh, many of the, this, uh, the even consumer electronics, right? Um, of course, uh, in those kind of the uh, atomic layer heterostructures, you can produce the quasi two-dimensionalities, and also you can produce some of the topological systems, such as mercury telluride uh, heterostructure is a good example in the recent uh, the development. Um, and the, this type of this, uh, the heterostructures or two-dimensionality also produce a lot of exciting physics, uh, where often the topology is uh, the quite rele relevant. The story I want to kind of focus today is a little bit kind of uh, the related with uh, this type of the semiconductor heterostructures, but in somewhat different directions. In fact, actually, that story starting with probably about 15 years ago, uh, when uh, Kostya Novoselov and Andre Guy first demonstrate that indeed different type of the two-dimensional system can be produced and studied. Um, so this graphene that extracted from the graphite uh, using simple mechanical exfoliation method already start kind of produce quite exciting new physics that such as the Dirac fermions and the quasi relativistic uh, the carrier dynamics and those kind of things really kind of start to excite the field and a lot of people that start kind of under, uh, try to understand this uh, two dimensionality of the system. But in a sense that was just the beginning of the really big uh, uh, the, uh, endeavors. Soon after graphene, uh, people start to realize, or community start to realize, there are other type of the two-dimensional materials that can be produced, uh, either growth or extractions or various methods that people start to see that one by one, the rediscovery of these materials in the extremely small atomic layer form. For example, the boron nitride, which is very similar to graphene like the form, just replace the two carbon atoms into the nitrogen and boron, such that you make the ionic bond, that this material is insulator, although it looks like the graphene like the structures, but it is extremely good insulator. For example, the band gap is large, uh, single crystalline boron nitride, hexaboron nitride can serve a good dielectric as a substrate. Transient metal dichacogenide is another example. It has been known materials, but now one can actually break this van der Waals interactions down to monoatomic layer unit cell, and they start to get this kind of various different type of flavor of the transition metal dichacogenide. 
cuprate, among some of the cuprate we know, for example, the bismuth strontium calcium copper oxide, often we call the BISCO, is a good example that again you can produce down to monoatomic layers. And there are many other systems where they're inorganic and organics, and basically there are zillions of these systems that nature provides us to make this monoatom unicell, and that as a kind of basis that we can just build up the sum of the system. Even more exciting part is uh, this as a unicell of the uh, thickness of the system as a building block. We know that they come with a various different type of flavor. Graphene is a drug material, so the first kind of drug uh, 2D materials, but that's not only the case. If you just go to transition metal dichogenide, you can get a semiconductor, superconductor, charge dense wave system. Of course, BISCO is a, uh, the strongly correlated cuprate uh, superconductors. There are topological, uh, topological materials such as bismuth selenide, uh, bismuth telluride, and those kind of things also come as a van der Waals material. In a sense, you can control uh, the number of the layers down to just kind of starting from the atomic unit cell. So certainly, this type of this, uh, the interesting quasi two-dimensional material, van der Waals two-D materials, uh, provide us a building block that we can build up the kind of new type of the system. Not only that you can study down to the two-dimensional limits, also, you can just stack them together, make the kind of different type of quasi-dimensional st uh, structures, which actually allows us to build up the quite exciting new system. Now, all of this thing is not just kind of PowerPoint presentation. Past 10 years or so, the community started to develop the way of the growing this in heterostructures, or more precisely, also way of the stack them, literally stack them uh, to make the, this quasi-three-dimensional structures. Here's a good example. This was worked on uh, in the collaboration with Columbia Group, uh, Jim Hohn's group. Just to break the, this material by the layer by layer and restack them together, form this type of the atomically sharp structures. You see that this, uh, the cross-sectional TM image almost shows the cross-sectional images that I showed in the first slide where the three-dimensional, the, uh, the MB-grown semiconductor heterostructures, layers extremely sharp, no impurities, but nevertheless, you can get kind of interesting functionality. In particular example that I'm showing you here, the graphene encapsulated by the boron nitride. Since boron nitride is an extremely good dielectric and substrate, the mobility of the electron in the graphene is exceeding the almost millions. Mean free path is close to millimeters. And those kind of devices, you can make this contact on all of the individual atomic layers. Immediately start to produce some of the exciting devices. For example, you can build up the device such that the electron moves almost like the ballistically in the system. Or you can think about in terms of electron wave functions. Since it is ballistically moves and wave functions move, you can actually use the electron as like this a photon. Or you can build up the optical devices based on this electron, ballistic electron motion in the device, where that you can use the gate to control the on and off the current. This completely different type of electron switch can be built based on this type of the, um, uh, the high mobility graphene. You don't have to space by it on the graphene. You can actually build up the system with uh, various different combinations. Here's another example, right? Uh, here that we just kind of uh, plug in the moly disulfide, which is n-type semiconductor combined with graphene, encapsulated again by the graphene. This type of device actually shows, again, very high mobilities uh, under the magnetic field. The quantum oscillation appears. I think basically, one can use this type of the basic ingredient. You can build up the complicated and much more functional devices by just uh, stack them together. Nowadays, in this community of these uh, 2D materials and then uh, their heterostructures, build up the devices with multiple layers. I think you probably hear throughout this week as well as the rest of the week what kind of interesting device one can produce uh, that just combining the two different type of the materials and build up the many, many layers with many functionalities and all the individual atomic layers can be in principle contact, right? This is not only device and application, however, that there is a new physics actually one can think about. I'm showing you here is a kind of example of the table, right? Uh, so the, the, in the row that we just kind of put this graphene, boron nitride, molydisulfide, they say some of the different materials, N-type and P-type semiconductor, superconductor, charge dense wave. I just kind of repeat the same thing in the, uh, in the column. And the purpose of this table is to uh, think about that we just kind of combine that one system to the, the other one, right? Some of the, this table is uh, rather exotic, something like that. How about the, you just consider interface between superconductor and ferromagnets? Well, the ground state kind of can compete each other. What do you expect that the interfacial state should look like? And this is kind of interesting and deep questions. 
Some of them might be actually simple, such as, uh, say, tungsten diselenide, P-type semiconductor, molydisulfide, and type some semiconductor. If you just put them together, what do you expect? Well, we know from device physics, those kind of PN system, PN semiconductor, put them together, they will form just PN junctions, PN diode, right? I mean, we probably need, uh, we understand everything. However, that's a kind of important difference. All of these things, even if it is simple PN junctions, PN diode, they are atomically thin, which means when just put them together to form the PN junctions, there is no depletion layer can form because Basically, it's atomically thin. So how do you understand such a kind of thin PN junctions? Well, you have to basically start with the quantum mechanics and just uh, try to understand. Important part is not only you just kind of try to understand, you can build and just kind of study them. You can build, you can just connect an electrode, you can send the current, to set, uh, shine the lights, and then you can quickly see that there are rather intriguing things can happen. For example, when, she, when you shine the lights on this uh, uh, PN junctions, you can, of course, form the, the extons and exton of the, each of the layers, uh, but also they can form these extons and where the electron hole is across the layer, right? This interlay exton is a kind of, for example, interesting species such that we can just study them optically, but also we can control them electrically because they are so thin, we have the, all the gates and contacts that allows us to control those kind of interesting the interlay exon species. For example, here's a, the example, the recent example, it's even unpublished result, that we just put the moly disulfide, tungsten disulfide, form these PN junctions, they're all connected electrode, we just put, the, uh, put them, the, the gates control their, the exon formation. Well, that turns out, simply the gate operation, you can change the exon energies. And that's understandable in a sense that we can uh, control the band offset by the gate voltages. But not only energies, it seems like the gate can control that the position of this electron hole within this kind of confined quantum well, which means that we can uh, control the overlap of the, this, the electron hole wave function to form the, way, uh, the extons, which allows us to kind of change the lifetime of the this extons. And furthermore, since this exton is formed across the layer, they have inherently long lifetime, which even just kind of make longer by just forming the gate voltage, something like half microseconds of long lifetime, compared with three orders of magnitude longer than just exton created inside of simple just two-dimensional system. This evolved the new properties that we can create out of these three-dimensional structures that allows us that we can just make this exton long lived and which means that once you create the exton, they start to kind of diffuse that uh, they're all across the sample and you can control this diffusion of the exons, simply just controlling the exon densities and so on, right? So this type of things actually start to give us a new uh, perspective. Maybe we can just build up this somewhat interesting, intriguing devices based on the excitons and their long-lived long -lived excitons, which we created this type of the atomically thin heterostructures. Not only you just kind of create them by the slide, you can also control their positions. For example, that using the same technology we learned from semiconductor structures, where the, all the mesoscopic physics build up, we can build up the gates that control this local electric field and local charge densities. And just so we can guide this, all these excitons or charged excitons by simply just using those kind of gates to create one places and move on other places and just kind of trap into some of the places. Those kind of things is now within the engineering regimes that we can just control in the experiments. Right. All of these things actually now lead into the also new physics, right? If you just put the, a lot of these interlay extons in the one location by shining the a little bit more intense light or using the, uh, the trap, one can quickly find out that exton energy increases as you just put the more extons. Uh, that's understandable because it's an interlay exon. Their dipole moment is in the same directions. Put them together in the very close space. Basically, they start to repair each other. Right, so the energy get, uh, kind of becomes higher. If you just understand that how much energy increases, in fact, you can estimate how many extons we created in the given situation. Of course, the long-lived exon, we can create more, right? And creating more of this exon is always kind of exciting part. And part of the reason that it becomes exciting is exon as a composite boson. If you create a lot of exon, there is a chance that this exon may condense into the many-body states what we call this exon bose condensation, right? Given that, that this, uh, the current conditions, we know that we can create a quite significant of exons, but not yet probably up to the level that we can condense that down. But 
we are trying hard. We, to, we can start to see that whether we can create more externals without heating the system too much. For example, you can just trap them into certain location by designing of the, this electro, uh, the electrostatic traps, as I mentioned before. But also, instead of using the light, because it's a PN junction, we can inject the charges, electrons and holes through the electrode and let them combine to make the interlay externals. And also we can just detect them, just kind of looking at the light coming out of from these PN junctions. So all of these things start kind of make us that, okay, simple, even for simple PN junctions, it is not as simple as we think, right? And this is just the beginning, right? If you just look back at the table, there are many different types of interfaces. We can create it by just combining different type of materials. Well, turns out it is not only different type of materials. Even with the same materials, there's additional now that we start to figure it out. And that is basically stacking angle, right? Imagine that I have the graphene sheet of the graphene and sheet of boron right? As I mentioned that, just kind of put them together, we can create a nice heterostructures. structures. There's one thing I just uh, didn't specify. In fact, we can just kind of put them in the different type of the angle. For example, graphene and boron nitride, there's a small mismatch between them. So even if you just try to put exactly on the top of that, they cannot match. There's inherently incommensurate structures. Even more so, if you just put them into a different angle, you start to see that their interesting pattern appears. And often this is what we call the Moare pattern. Whenever two similar lattice put them together with angles, basically there is uh, the, uh, the quasi-periodic structures appears with a larger uh, uh, periodicity, which are often controlled by this angle of the, the skank stacking together. Even simple system, like the graphene on the top of the boron nitride, when you apply this enormous magnetic field, which actually Greg allows us to do that <laughs> in Florida, you start to see very amazing uh, kind of different type of things you didn't imagine to appear. For example, because of magnet, strong magnetic field create the, its own periodicities, which can compete with this Moare periodicity, you start to get this quantum effect you see is very different. Here is a good example. We measured this uh, sample in the, uh, in the uh, Palasi high, high magnetic field lab, graphene on boron nitride, right? simple system. But surprisingly, when you just kind of put in the right angle, such that the magnetic field, magnetic unit cells compete with this, uh, the Moare unit cell, you start to see the quantum physics is rather different. And there is some of the additional periods you have to actually uh, chase it out. It turns out this problem is deeply tied with what Douglas, uh, the Douglas Hofschelers actually uh, originally envisioned as a Hofschelers butterfly, which actually deeply related fractal energy spectrums of this competing uh, two periodicity. Turns out the, in this particular case, if you just look at this uh, quantum wave effect, a quantum wave effect is not only just a regular quantum wave effect, it is so-called a fractal quantum wave effect, where you start to see that this is uh, the self-similar recurrence of the quantum wave effect actually has to be seen in this type of system. So this is a good example that simply that just put them together, give additional structures. It can be quite different. It's not only two dissimilar materials that are very close by. Even with the same materials, say graphene on the graph, graphene, or same materials, but just kind of give you some small twisting angle. They also produce quite intriguing structures. Again, in this simple picture, I just showed the two graphene layers together, put them together and ask what is going to happen, right? Well, there's more other patterns, as I mentioned, uh, but because it's the same materials, uh, they may have to do some things, and especially in graphene, to graphene, we know that they want to be uh, so-called bonus stacking with the really periodic structures. Now, if I just put them together with a macroscopic uh, the boundary condition, such that I don't want to let them globally relax, but let them locally relax, in a sense, 2D material, because it is so thin material, like the soft matter you're going to hear the next, next talk, right? They can deform locally. They can happily deform, and these are flexibilities, reconstruct this lattice. Indeed, when you just kind of put them, this, uh, the two similar materials together, like the graphene to graphene, in detail, they start kind of reconstruct the lattice to form kind of new type of structures. This checkerboard style shows that each of the, the checkerboard is AB bonus stacking and BA bonus stacking. And in between, basically, you have to deal with all these incommensurations by forming this, uh, this commensuration line or structure solitons in between. Right. All of these things start to show that even just atomic length scale, atomic structure, looks very interesting. But what's exciting more is that it's not only structures. Often, that 
this electronic property is quite unex uh, unexpectedly interesting. Anyone came to the last APS meeting in the 19, uh, 2018? There was a really kind of great story just revealed in particular in this APS meeting. Pablo Hario Aero's group at the MIT, actually they've been working on this uh, twisted graphene layer so for some time, and they actually see the quite interesting behavior in graphene twist layer in certain kind of fixed angle. Somehow, this graphene as a semi-metal, as a, this the drug metal, so it should be conducting, but if you just put them in the specific angle, what they call the magic angle, the graphene becomes insulating, supposed to be metallic graphene, becomes insulating, indicating that is some sort of correlated insulating state appears in middle of the band. Turns out when you actually dope this type of the, uh, the insulator, it becomes even superconductor. It almost kind of reminds us something like this kind of cupular physics. You start with the correlate insulators and dope to make the superconductor, and superconductor is a rather decent levels, right? It turns out the physics behind of the, this interesting part is that, again, related back to the, those kind of more patterns and the reconstructions of the lattice, which also allows to just reconstruct the electronic structures in particular magic angle that uh, the theory expected by the Alan McDonald for about 10 years ago, uh, about one degrees. Basically, you start to create this, uh, the maximally localized electrons uh, sitting in this uh, some part of the lattice, which is uh, probably responsible for the discorrelate uh, the insulator and potentially the superconductor. And this is kind of really exciting example that such a simple system and such a simple controllabilities yet produce uh, quite unexpected electronic structures. Well, it is uh, just the beginning. Turns out it doesn't have to be only just graphene to graphene. For example, that quite recently, if you just put the bilayer graph into the bilayer graph, it's a little bit more complicated system, but we have more controllability because we cannot apply the electric field to control its own band. It turns out, it seems like, uh, it's also unpublished result, it's just pro, uh, the report in this, uh, this meeting. It turns out you create a correlate uh, insulator like this uh, single layer twisted uh, graphene, but also it's not only simple insulator, it seems like it is spin polarized insulator, or you can call the ferromagnets. Surely when you dope this type of the ferromagnet, it becomes a superconducting, and superconducting uh, TC actually enhanced with the magnet, applying the small amount of magnetic field. All of these things start to indu uh, the indicating that uh, maybe this uh, type of the insulator, even the superconductor, is a very unconventional. Again, it doesn't have to be graphene. It turns out many, many groups start to report that whenever you just put this uh, uh, right choice of the different materials with the right angle or just kind of some angles, then some of the correlate state appears. So for example, here is a tungsten diselenide, tungsten diselenide, two semiconductor, put them together, resistance is dangerous close to zero, maybe indicating the superconductors, right? All of these things, actually, you start to see that such a simple additional degree of freedom that control, you start to get a very different type of the system somehow, right? Well, it's not only the periodic structures. Turns out, if you just put it, kind of choose a right angle, something like the photographing, 30 degrees, it becomes, in fact, a quasi-crystal, 2D quasi-crystal. This example that which was published in the last year, put the graphene, two, two graphene layer, now not kind of small, one degree of twisting angle, 30 degree and put them together. Structure-wise, it becomes quasi-crystal. There is no periodicity, but there is a 12-fold symmetry in the system. Not only structures, and this group actually see that when you just do the RPS, there are quite intriguing structures that appear in the electronic structures due to the discordant crystalness of the system. Now, at this point, it is only graphene to graphene, but I'm sure it's not only graphene, but many of the 2D materials, if you just can put them in the right angle, or put, the, put them in the right conditions, you can create not only periodic structures or quasi-periodic uh, quasi structures, but also this quasi-crystal-like structures. So you start to see there a lot of this possibility, but not only just choosing the right materials, but choosing the right angles, you get the kind of new type of the functionalities. But story is not ending there. In fact, we can actually build up, again, back to the three-dimensional structures, right? Layer the system, we know that we can actually insert atoms or molecules, even organic molecules or big molecules. This intercalation of the layer materials has been around many, many years, right? Now, you can actually think about, instead of inserting the molecules or intercalating molecules in the bulk layered materials, 
why not we just kind of start with very thin, atomically thin materials? Of course, one single layer we cannot intercalate. But as long as we have the two layers, say bilayer graphene, right? We can intercalate this bilayer graphene with something like the lithium to make the batteries or some other molecules, right? Or even more, you can actually insert the molecules and systems in heterostructures or different angle, right? So you start to see that on the top of this controllability I just kind of mentioned about this uh, different twisting angle. Now, if you start kind of think about this uh, different molecules, you can certainly expand this uh, the bank of the materials that we have is actually enormous kind of phase space, right? Well, it's again not a cartoon. One can actually build these materials, uh, the heterostructures, as I mentioned. Not only you build the heterostructures, you can connect them uh, with the, all the electrode. Not only you just kind of make the electronic device, you can turn this electrochemical cell such that you just kind of bias it or gate, applying the gate voltages to control the intercalation into the, this uh, specific uh, the layers. Quite recent demonstration that has been done here uh, is, for example, that you have the graphene and moly disulfide, then uh, the boron nitride, and create these heterostructures. And there are many different hetero layers. By controlling the voltages onto the, this electrochemical cell, which means in this device, you can actually control that, how that you can control the intercalations. But not only that, as a physicist, that you can also measure the transport at the same time you're intercalating, applying the magnetic field, right? And just kind of measure the whole, whole, uh, the whole measurement, or you can measure the quantum oscillation. It's amazing me that if you just do the right control while you're intercalating the system, system remains is clean enough such that you can just induce quantum oscillation, whose information, together with the whole effect measurement, can tell us that where we start to intercalate these materials, how much intercalation efficiency is happening, right? And amazing things can happen by just kind of choosing different type of interfacial structures that we can actually control the amount of charge we can insert into the, this system by designing in principle, right? So all of this idea that I just present start kind of give you a list of hope, uh, the feeling that what type of the engineering capabilities we actually start to stuck in to the, our system. All right, so I think that uh, my time is almost up, so let me just kind of the end uh, with kind of going back to the slide I started with, right? In a sense, I just kind of tried to convince you that uh, we have uh, a lot of the interesting two-dimensional system, and largely that it is uh, that uh, benefited by this uh, a lot of the interesting development of these bulk materials, and we just use a subset of materials where that you can have these van der Waals layers. We can utilize that van der Waals layer to break the material down to the very thin limits, right? But then now we have the capability, just kind of starting with those kind of thin 2D limits, but rebuild the, these three-dimensional structures by different sequence, by different angle, without worrying about this interfacial, the atomic scale of the matching. In some sense, we actually use those kind of the freedoms of the van der Waals interface, even just control the, uh, uh, the strains that, or strain engineering to build up this interesting, the additional uh, periodic structures. On the top of that, we can actually also still control that's something that we can insert in between. It doesn't have to be even just a two-dimensional system. Maybe it's just kind of ions or atoms by electrochemical process. All of these things allows us that we start, start, start creating some of the interface in some sense, hopefully by the designing. And many of the, this interface, we don't know what is happening or even don't know what is going to happen, right? Because sometimes when you just put this kind of together, these competing orders at such a close atomic distance, Maybe some new physics may kind of arises. As a good example of this, uh, this superconductivity appears in the twisted bilayer graphene. All right, with that, I want to kind of thank uh, the, uh, my groups as well as my collaborators that make the, this talk happen. And also thank you for your attention. Thanks. That was wonderful. Uh, there is time for questions and if possible, there are mics in the aisles, or if you speak loudly, I can repeat. Are there some questions? Yes, please, over there. Thank you very much for the fantastic talk. Uh, well, I would like to ask about the growth of 2D materials and heterostructures, and, and 
prospects for applications because what you have shown is mainly for exfoliated and right. of course there's a lot of fantastic physics but maybe the application is also important. That's right. I think um, so growth is uh, of course important in the large scale of the growth is very extremely important issues uh, especially if you're interested in the applications but also even for the physics high quality material is always kind of important part. Um, I would say that uh, graphene uh, growth is something most advanced. A part of the reason is it's been around now 15 years. Um, there are many techniques such as chemical vapor depositions or even the MB type of the growth has been happened. And quality of those large scale device, uh, the large scale graphene sample is not necessarily too bad. I think probably factor of few worse than uh, say uh, exfoliate sample you can get. Now, the other type of the two-dimensional materials, there are still rooms. I think it's relatively new. And uh, uh, as you go for the TMDC, I think that's the next runner that uh, people start to produce in the larger scale. There's, I would say there is still room. Part of the reason is that the uh, difficult part is uh, the exact control of the growth, such as MB technique and MOCVD technique, is a little bit challenging there because, in a sense, the Van der Waals interface is, in, uh, in some sense, a blessing for us but also a curse for the, this epitaxial growth because it's a bit difficult to kind of just make the large scale of the single domain without kind of good epitaxy. So I think I'm reasonably optimistic because uh, in, the, in the beginning, the people were worrying that, well, you never actually get this graphene high quality in the large scale, but that's now being proven to be wrong. I hope, I hope that the similar things happen in large scale of these other 2D materials. And certainly it is more challenging than graphene because there are more elements in there, but I hope. Other questions? Yes, please, go to the mic. Uh, thank you for the fantastic talk. So I wonder in this uh, superconducting twisted by layer systems, also in tungsten dicetinite, why the resistive curve across TC is so broad? Uh -huh. Well, so I, I hope that I just kind of address this right. I try to avoid it cl claim the superconductivity yet. I think <laughs> it's, a, it's a very much hinted in some sense because we are seeing the resistivity drops almost, a, almost close to order magnitude compared with, say, 50 Kelvin temperature. So uh, there is a, a possibility that indeed it becomes a superconducting state. However, um, at this point that uh, the making good contact on semiconductor is uh, much more challenging than uh, the, the, the conducting system like the graphene. So all these mesoscopic size of sample that uh, try to measure really low resistance with relatively high contact, there's a, some experimental challenges. So I want to kind of put out a bit of caution that whether it is indeed kind of superconducting states at this point, but uh, it's a suggestive. So you have to wait until a little bit more or you come to the technical talk of the one of my poster who will give a talk, in, I believe, on Thursday. Yes, uh, please, one more. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, um, it's very exciting, like a lot of uh, new properties coming out when you put one atomic layer on top of another one. But uh, like um, um, intuitively, you know, people would think that since they are like a, more like a Van der Waals like force, mm -hmm. like people, it seems like my feeling like the community is like all oh, just assuming they are like, uh, atomic flat and they don't have like a physical like a uh, structure like uh, change like some buckling or some like actually like crystal like a unicell wise change like uh, action, uh, of these two interactions and uh, most of them just like from DFT calculations right. they do some like uh, modeling just assume it's just flat there's no right. like a yeah. um, it's a very good point can Indeed. you comment on the experimental like right. effort like uh, right now thank you yeah thank you uh, thank you for it. very critical uh, Questions. Um, it is right that uh, a lot of the beginning starting is, in fact, it's uh, simple to assume that it's a flat and just kind of rigidly rotated. But indeed, in the reality, that, that's not the case, as you just pointed out. And uh, because the 2D material is, in a sense, is a kind of squash material elastically, right? So you can, you can think about there's a deformations. And I just tried to show the one TM image. Indeed, that's the case. And not only just in plane deformation, indeed there is outer plane deformation like the bucklings and in the, in the worst case can happen. Um, all of these things indeed kind of need to be studied and some part actually is being studied. Now there is even uh, the modeling that considering all this realistic deformation including buckling is kind of uh, 
put in there. All of this thing actually depends on the a little bit detail, and experiments and the theory should go together to get the holistic pictures. Indeed, that's kind of important problem you pointed out. Yeah, thank you, but like, I was wishing that you can comment on what kind of experimental techniques can be potentially like uh, detect this kind of uh, very um, surface kind of crystal structure change, though. Um, certainly, is the scanning probe techniques uh, is kind of really sensitive to the buckling. Uh, for the, even the TM that if you tilt it in the right, that you can get the information of the buckling. Uh, so there is a, uh, other type of the real space imaging technique uh, also allows you to just get this atomic scale deformation. But those scanning Very good. will be um, just local like uh, scanning probes though. How do you, but like, more, what, more, what actually influence most would be like crystal like uh, structure change, like unit cell wise, uh, like yeah. long range order. Right, right? I think, yes, uh, but on the top of that, in fact, also the environments. Uh, because if you just put this sample on the substrate, there's strong substrate interactions that will suppress this uh, outer plane buckling. But for example, if you just study the suspense structures, the, the buckling effect becomes really uh, stronger. So it has been uh, seen some of the experiments. Good. Let's thank Philip again. Thank, thank you. you so much.